great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight for a virtual evening with best-selling author Nancy Thayer. Uh, best-selling author Nancy Thayer is with us tonight to discuss her new book, Summer Love. Uh, a little bit about the book. Old secrets come to light when four friends gather on Nantucket for a life-changing reunion in this heartwarming novel of love and, and self-discovery by New York Times best-selling author Nancy Thayer. Summer is in full swing on sunny Nantucket and four old friends decide to hold a reunion on the island where they've made fond memories nearly three decades earlier. Yet as the crew gathers for one eventful week in July, it becomes clear that old secrets, jealousies, and betrayals will be revealed. Ooh. And all the while, their 20-something-year-old children will embark on exciting new adventures of their own. Uh, Nancy Thayer shines uh, yet again with another sunswept tale of summer love and self-discovery. So uh, Nancy Thayer is the New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 novels, including Summer Love, Family Reunion, Girls of Summer, Let It Snow, Surfside Sisters, A Nantucket Wedding, Secrets in Summer, The Island House, The Guest Cottage, An Island Christmas, Nantucket Sisters, and Island Girls. Born in Kansas, Nancy has been a resident of Nantucket for 35 years, where she currently lives with her husband, Charlie, and their rescue cat named Callie. Uh, so all of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Nancy for joining us this evening. And Nancy, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Can everyone hear me? Somebody said I was muted. Um, no, uh, they probably just didn't have their volume turned up, Nancy. Okay. That happens all the time. That, that happens with me. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to, to see everyone. Well, I'm not seeing you, but I'm sharing this moment with you. And it's, it's immeasurable how much pleasure a writer gets from knowing that there's somebody out there who likes what she's written, who, who enjoys her novels. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm here on Nantucket. Uh, I've lived here for almost 38 years with my husband. Um, and today was the first really hot day. And so I'm, I'm trying to keep out of the glare of the light. I hope it doesn't drive you crazy. Um, I wanted to talk about the book Summer Love and what inspired it because um, I will start off by saying that I have written a lot of books uh, and I always knew that I wanted to be a writer and um, I went to the University of Kansas in, in of Missouri in Kansas City, and I have a bachelor's and a master's in English literature, which I got in 1966 without ever having to read a book by a woman. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. That was even, well, that was before Oprah. Um, it, was, it was before um, Annie, what is her name? No, Gloria Steinem. It was way back then. And I remember thinking, I want to write about real families and real life um, because I think there's a lot of drama and tragedy and joy and surprise um, in, oh, Jill? Jill Burrell just said there's no, vert no visual. Yeah, Nancy, uh, don't pay too much attention to the chat. <laughs> I, I, think, I think she might be expecting slides or a PowerPoint presentation. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is hide my screen so I'm not a distraction. But just know, Nancy, that I'm listening in and I'm watching. And if you need me for anything, I'm right here. But I don't, I don't want to serve as a distraction. I'll monitor the chat, though, and, and don't, don't worry about folks in the chat. I'll, I'll take care of them. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Thank you. So... I knew I wanted to write about families and friendship and what I call ordinary people because I think I'm an ordinary person. I grew up in 
Kansas. Um, I had a nice family. Um, I was very jealous of my younger sister who has blue eyes and blonde hair. And um, there was so much drama in everyday life that was fascinating that I thought, yeah, this is what I want to write about. So I got married, and some of you know this, I got married when I was 20 uh, to my psychology professor who was 36 and had been divorced twice. And um, I thought this was, hey, this is fabulous, this is fun. Um, and I became a stepmother, which was wonderful. That was one of the best parts of that marriage. Um, he was a professor and so we lived for one semester in Paris and one semester in Amsterdam and one semester in Helsinki um, on an island called Kulasari. Um, and he had a Fulbright and was teaching and I had two children, five and three. And it was during that time that I wrote my first novel, the first one that got published. I had published quite a few short stories in literary journals, um, but, and I had sent a, a manuscript to Julian Bach, who is an agent and who accepted it, but it didn't get picked up. So if anybody out there is trying to, to sell a novel, um, be strong uh, and persevere because it takes time. Stepping, my first novel was about being a stepmother and having little children. And I wrote that during one hour every afternoon while I made the children take their naps. So that was, well, the book came out, it was bought by Doubleday about two years before that, but it came out in January of 1980. So that's a long time ago, isn't it? Um, and since then I've written, my children have grown up, my daughter has gotten married and had children and her best friend from when she was in kindergarten um, often came to visit us in the summer on Nantucket, which is wonderful. And two years ago, before COVID hit, my daughter Sam and her husband and their four children and Sarah and her husband and their son came to visit and I thought, not only can I look back at my life and see sort of how it's turned out. Did my dreams come true? But I can look at my children's lives and, and I can remember a time when my children were teenagers and what all the mothers said was, I'll be happy if they aren't dead or in jail. <laughs> and that's, you know, working with teenagers, you're just, it's, it's hard. I found it very hard. Um, so Sam and Sarah and Tommy and Aaron were here with their children. And I would drive them to one of our beaches. And the beach, the ocean in the summer, it's it's glorious, it is, it's a gift. It's full of beauty and, this, and you're part of the universe, part of the universe that you seldom see sweeps in and sweeps over you. And um, I'm getting the cover of this book. Um, this is what this book is about. It's about people falling in love with, with each other on the island, which they do a lot. Uh, and summer loves don't always last, but sometimes they do. But we also fall in love with the island. We fall in love with summer. 
we wait and wait for summer to come. And when people come to Nantucket, um, they come in order to be happy, to have a wonderful experience. It's not like they're going to the hospital. Um, they're not going to the dentist. They're coming to this eccentric small piece of sand 30 miles from the mainland, no bridge. You have to either take the ferry or fly and nobody can afford to fly now, but the ferries are wonderful. So I thought about the years when my daughter Sam and her friend Sarah lived with us. Um, and they both worked in the summer because even now, especially now, if you have housing on Nantucket, you can make a ton of money in the summer. Restaurants and bars and retail stores are desperate for help. So if anybody out there has housing on Nantucket and wants to make money, this is the summer to do it. But it's always been that way. It's always been a place where kids can come, get a job, work for the summer, go to some beach parties. And, and I saw all that happen with my, my children who are now grown up. And now I'm starting to watch it happen with my grandchildren. Um, and I thought, I don't, I don't think I want to write a novel about family. I think I want to write about friends who come when they're 22, they've graduated from college. So they think, they think they're adult, they're set, um, they're smart, and, and yet are they? Um, one of the questions I asked this summer when I um, talked to, to people on on Zoom was, did anybody do anything foolish when they were 20, 21, or 22? Because we expect teenagers to do foolish things. Um, but we kind of think, well, after we're 21, we're adults, we can drink, right? And um, all of this was in my mind. And, and at the same time, and always on this island, hotels, real hotels, were being knocked down, renovated, rebuilt, renamed. And, and this is going on right now all the time with houses. And in fact, uh, the saying now on Nantucket is, who, know, who knew there were so many billionaires. Um, it, it's, the island is always changing, not just with the buildings, but also with the storms which sweep away the cliffs and the rising seas. But I thought, okay, I'm going to set this in 1995 because I think that's about the time my children were in their early 20s. And, um, and the first person that I thought of who would come to this island and get a job um, was a lovely, smart, willowy blonde. Um, because there are a lot of lovely, smart, willowy blondes who come to this island. But I liked her, her name is Ariel. And um, she's graduated from college. She's gotten a job uh, with a real estate company being the receptionist. And she interviews at a hotel that is in the midst of being renamed and restored and rebuilt. And really the only working part of the hotel is the office on ground level and the basement, which is rooms, it's housing for staff. And there are four bedrooms, one bathroom. It's not beautiful. 
And uh, that's sort of how most people who work here live. I mean, there are a lot of beautiful places to live, but a lot of the workers who do so much work here um, have to go home and sleep six to a room, that sort of thing. Anyway, Ariel is the first person who gets accepted to have a job in this old hotel. And the next person who came to mind, and this is what happens. I sit there, I think about the people I've known, the people who are here now. I would never ever use someone I know or someone real on this island because I don't want to be sued. Um, but the second person who showed up was Nick, who's very handsome. He's mostly Russian, Russian-American. He's charming. He has black hair. He, he, he could be the prince in, in one of uh, the Russian books. He's, he's handsome. He's charming. And he really likes people. And <laughs> there are people like that. There are people who, who feel alive when they're making other people happy. I think teachers are people like this. Um, I think writers tend to be much more solitary. Um, but Nick is one of those guys who loves to charm. And um, he gets a room in the basement and he gets a job at a man's clothing store, a very high level, a very expensive man's clothing store where they sell the pants, the red pants, the faded red pants with embroidered whales on them. Uh, the next person I thought of was, okay, I want somebody different from Nick, but he has to be a man. So I thought of a man named Wyatt, who is from Missouri, and who, whose father is a scientist, and whose father expects Wyatt to be a scientist too. And Wyatt has been a good son. And he comes to Nantucket just for the summer, just for a break before he goes back to his studies at the university. And then the final person who popped up is Sheila, who, who I really love. I feel very close to Sheila because she's from the Midwest. She's naive. Um, she looks different. From than I do. She has red hair and she's very uh, buxom and and but she, she's shy and she's hopeful and she's naive and she's the character who gets into the most trouble on on this island during that summer. And these four people come like so many people who are here now like so many young people everywhere, or just people everywhere, uh, with their dreams and their hopes. And um, they come to the island and they, they take their rooms, they put their luggage in there. And then Nick says, we're going to go for a swim. And they rent bikes and they go to, Jetty's Beach and they run into the water and Nick of course leads the way he and Ariel they're both completely in love with the water Sheila's a little uh self-conscious uh, but that is the start of their summer and their adventures and I I got very personally involved as I do with my characters because I'm also thinking about my own life, my own children, what's happening, how different teenagers are now from the way 
they were in 1995. And so I have them come back for a reunion in 2020. And there are three children who aren't children anymore. They're 22. And they come with um, their parents um, and start up their own relationships. Um, and maybe some of you have read the book, um, but I won't tell you what's going to happen, except that I knew I wanted these people to be happy. Um, I knew, well, for one thing, because I was writing this book and thinking about this subject, I realized, um, and I feel guilty, and it's really hard to admit it because I always think, you know, lightning will strike, but my dream has come true. I always wanted to write. I wrote a lot when I was a teenager and it didn't get, I didn't even send it anywhere. Um, I, I didn't get my first novel. I didn't sell it until I was 33 and it didn't get published until I was 35. So that's a long time. That's a long time to have your dreams come true. But, but since then, and fortunately, um, I've continued to write. I've had different writers, different editors, different agents. And if you ever want me, if you want me to talk a little bit about how the publishing world has changed, I would be glad to do that because just like everything else, the publishing world has changed a lot, but I'm still delighted to be part of it. Um, I, can, I can talk some more, but I'd love it if there are any questions or if you have anything, any topic you'd like me to discuss, so Nancy, I, I can start and uh, I would enc encourage audience members to get your questions in for Nancy. It's not every day that we get to Zoom with a New York Times bestselling author and uh, she wants to hear from you and your questions. Uh, but Nancy, there are at least a few folks on the line who are members of the Tewksbury Writing Group. Uh, we meet monthly. And uh, so I think that uh, there would certainly be some interest if you wanted to discuss the publishing industry and, and perhaps just broader, uh, you know, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? Good, I would love to do that. And I'm glad there is a writing group because when anyone asks me for advice about writing, I always have two, two bits of advice. The first is to read the book called Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. That will tell you everything you need to know about writing and it will make you so happy and it will make you feel like you, you can do it. Um, she's brilliant, the book is brilliant. The second bit of advice is join a writing group take a writing course, get with some people who are also writing and who will criticize you or at least give you some feedback because a lot of us, and I'm one of them, um, we're afraid to get it out there. And so we ask our husbands or our best friends, read this, what do you think? And they, of course they say, this is brilliant, it's wonderful. It's funny, um, and that's not who you need to hear from. You need to hear from other writers. So I'm really glad to know there is a writing group. Um, the publishing business is a business. And as some of you know, a lot of the smaller houses like Charles Scribner's and Son have been gobbled up by the bigger houses by the bigger fish, the bigger companies. Um, and uh, there is one person I know 
and you might know her too, she might have spoken for you. Um, Lisa Genova, who is a brilliant woman. She has a degree in uh, neurology, something about the brain from Harvard. And she wrote a book called Still Alice, which you might have read or you might have seen the movie uh, because Julianne Moore won the Oscar for that movie. Lisa Genova told us that she wrote the book Still Alice and no publishing house accepted it. And, and so she put it online. She somehow she put it onto the internet. She also got copies printed up and, and drove around selling copies out of the trunk of her car. Um, and still Alice is about a woman with early Alzheimer's. And it was absolutely gobbled up by people. They just bought it off the internet so much that publishing houses came to Lisa and said, we want to publish this book. We want to publish all your books. Um, and since then, she's written wonderful novels about all the many things that can go wrong with the brain, about autism um, and whatever else can go wrong with the brain. So um, I think I think you anybody who's trying to write should be brave and should persevere because things are are changing all the time. Um, when my first book was published, Stepping, I was living in Williamstown, Mass, where there's a college, and the people there are, um, they all act as if they're driving their grandfather's old Bentley because they're just so wealthy and, and smart. And um, when I wrote Stepping, uh, there was a review of it in the New York Times book review. And I thought, well, that's nice. I didn't, I didn't really understand. I had no idea about um, the complications of getting an agent, finding a publisher, and being sure that someone will help you publicize your book. Because now, like everything else, uh, being, being on the internet, uh, TikTok, which I'm not on, um, Instagram, Facebook, which I am on, um, it's, it's quite different than it was, and it's not as stuffy as it was. Um, and when I wrote Stepping, and it came out with a wonderful review in the New York Times book review, I was in the Williamstown bookstore, and the book was about being a stepmother and a mother of little children, and, uh, and wanting to find her way in the world. And I was in the bookstore and I was behind shelves and I heard the owner of the bookstore say, someone said, um, where do I find Nancy Thayer's book? And he said, over in the dirty diaper section. <laughs> and I knew that. I knew Ralph Rimsey. He lived next door. What, what? And that's what he thought. He thought because it's about children, because it's about women, because it's not about people going to war or exploring space, that, that it's really not important. Everything has changed now. Um, publishing is much more inclusive. Um, and they include not only uh, Black people and LBGT people, but they also include mothers and children in real novels. So um, I think it's really evolving. I think that's the wonderful thing about books. Uh, the writers are changing. There are new writers, so many new, wonderful funny, serious writers, both male and female. 
Uh, and uh, we actually did host Lisa, a matter of fact, in November, uh, although she was not the um, she was not the featured speaker, believe it or not. She was actually the interviewer. She was the conversation partner uh, for an author named Lynn Reeves. I'm not sure if you've heard of Lynn. Oh, I know uh, Lynn. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but besides uh, Lisa, who, who are some of your other favorite authors? Kathy would like to know. <laughs> um, well, of course, I can name so many authors because I read a lot. Um, I'm looking now at my pile of books that I have bought or received, and I'll tell you what's in the pile. Guilt by Jamie Brenner, who wrote a book called Blush, and she's brilliant and very sophisticated. Um, uh, Mary Kay Andrews, The Home Wreckers, which is very funny and very, oh, it's just wonderful, a wonderful summer read. Um, and I have uh, Jennifer Weiner's uh, The Summer Place. I think that's what it is. Um, and underneath that is um, a biography of Charles Lamb, who, <laughs> who was an essayist in England um, and who was a friend of Coleridge and Wordsworth. And if I hadn't published a novel. I could have gone that way, I think. I was really in love with Wordsworth poetry. I thought that Dorothy Wordsworth contributed more than she was given credit for. Um, but Charles Lamb was a brilliant man who, uh, who lived and he was educated and he, was, he wasn't wealthy, but he wasn't poor. Um, he lived with his family. He worked in a counting house, an accounting firm, and uh, his sister was insane, and one day his sister stabbed and killed their mother. And Charles Lamb was a young man then, and he took on the responsibility of taking care of his sister so she didn't have to be put into one of the very terrible insane asylums they had then. Um, I always have my secret vices like uh, romantic British poets uh, in my pile. Um, I read a lot of, let me see, what else? Um, oh, um, Emily Henry, I think that's her. She wrote a book called Book Lovers. Uh, Susan Wiggs. Um, I can't see them all. Uh, what it, Viola Shipman, who is Wade Rouse, has a new book out and he writes in the name of his grandmother and his books are just, they're reaching out to everyone. They're about grandmothers. Is there any more overlooked person than grandmothers? People just think we're sort of, rocking and knitting and um, and he writes uh, wonderful books in the voice of his grandmother. So I have that book to read. I have, um, well, you can see, oh, someone has just discovered Viola Shipman, so I will tell Wade. Okay, so Nancy, a follow-up question uh, from Eileen. Uh, do you and other, other uh, do you get together with any of your author buddies? Um, well, I haven't in the past two and a half years. Um, Ellen Hildebrand, of course, you all know, lives on Nantucket. And I saw her at a party two and a half years ago. It was a Christmas party. And she was there with her boyfriend and um, she leads a very glamorous life. She goes to St. Thomas or somewhere in the, in the uh, winter. And so we don't, also I'm so much older than she is. We don't ever just get together. Mm -hmm. um, about a block away from me lives Nat Philbrick 
who wrote the book In the Heart of the Sea about the whaling ship that was stove by a whale. And that was turned into a movie. And since then, Nat has been writing brilliant um, historical nonfiction. And we used to get together a lot. His wife, Melissa, um, Nat and Charlie are good friends. And I think we Zoomed with them a while ago, but we're going to see them. Um, well, he's busy on tours right now because he's doing real touring. Um, I don't, I know some other people who are writing, but I don't, I don't get together. I don't have a writer's group. Uh, this is sort of a silly question just for me, and then we'll get to some more serious questions. But we can see part of your library behind you. I'm curious, how do you have your books organized? Are they alphabetical by author's last name? <laughs> um, they are alphabetical by author. Okay. And one part of the library is my husband's side, oh. and this is my side, but we have taken over the rest of the house. Um, and I have, we have what is called an English basement. And um, it has a bathroom, it has nice rooms, nice guest rooms. Uh, friends stay there and grandchildren. But um, uh, several of the walls have been taken over by bookshelves and my books. Uh, the children have moved out. So two of the bedrooms are my husband's records and CDs. And then the rest of the upstairs is his books. Um, and I started putting a bookshelf in our bedroom <clears throat> because there's just <laughs> not enough space, but it is, we try to keep it alphabetically organized, yeah. <laughs> So we've talked about uh, your library, we've talked about your favorite authors, your book friends, the publishing industry, advice for aspiring writers. Let's talk more about your actual writing here. So Fran says, do you plan to keep writing books about Nantucket? I do, of course I do. Um, I'm working on one that will come out next year, set on Nantucket called All the Days of Summer. And I have, of course, I have other ideas in mind because I've lived here for so long. And in the winter, our population goes down to about 17,000 people. In the summer, it goes up to about 60,000 wow. people. And in the winter, which is the season I like best, um, that's when I like to go out and walk on the beach when the storms are coming in and the waves are, are just rising and splashing and the wind is howling. I really feel like um, I'm getting energized. And anywhere I go on this island gives me an idea for, for another book I'd like to write. Um, mm -hmm. I've written three Christmas books and I think some of you know that the book I wrote called Let It Snow, which came out, what, three years ago, four years? I can't remember. Um, it was made into a Hallmark movie called Nantucket Noel. And it might be on in July when they have their Christmas in July series. Um, but the sad thing about that is that they Hallmark sets their movies anywhere, but they film them in British Columbia. And um, so that has mountains and evergreen trees. And a lot of people were not happy about that. Um, but the thing is, when I sign a contract, um, that's it. They don't want to hear from me. They don't care what I think. Um, I don't mean they're not nice. They're just on, they're off on their own adventure. Um, as long as there are families on this island um, and in my life, um, and as long as 
my grandchildren keep <laughs> growing up and changing, um, then I'll be writing books. And uh, Eileen uh, has a related question. So aside from uh, Let It Snow, have you uh, ever been approached to make one of your books into a movies or a series? Uh, she says, I remember reading The Hut Flash Club years ago. It was so funny. And uh, Eileen thinks that would make a great movie or a movie series. Yeah, I think it would make a great series too. I'm trying to get the light out of my glasses, you know. I'm obsessed with that, Robert. Um, <laughs> I thought the Hot Flash Club would make a great series. Um, I've had on a, almost all of my books, I've had what is called an option, which means they pay something like $5,000 for the right to play around with making a script because making a movie involves so many people who have to cooperate. Um, I could never, I could never be a film writer. Um, a long time ago, 30 years ago, I wrote a book called Spirit Lost. I had just moved to Nantucket and a lot, our house was built in 1840. A lot of the houses that are old houses um, are rumored to have ghosts in them. So I wrote a book about a married couple who move into an old house and um, the man starts seeing a beautiful female ghost who says she's the widow of a whaling ship captain. But, but the, the wife never sees this ghost. So she's thinking, is he crazy? What's going on? That book was bought by United Entertainment um, and a man named Tim Rice, who had been an actor on a television show about a radio station, and I can't remember it, but he had, and he still might have, he had um, a studio where he made movies, for black audiences starring black people that were not movies about the ghetto or, or hip hop or slavery. And, and he made a beautiful movie called Spirit Lost. And you can rent it, I think, on Peacock or Netflix or something. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, I would warn you, there's a lot of sex in it. So you won't, I mean, really in the movie and the, not so much in the book, but the movie there's, and it's beautiful, but you probably don't want to watch it with your teenagers. <laughs> All right, uh, Joyce uh, asks a question, maybe more of a suggestion. You probably get unsolicited suggestions all the time. Uh, Joyce says, have you ever considered including in your book research comparing a Nantucket life for a summer uh, to one on Martha's Vineyard. So in other words, comparing the, the, the two uh, communities. Have you ever thought of that, Nancy? I haven't. Um, I've been to the vineyard once, twice. Um, I, I've been there twice. Um, I know that our football teams are great rivals. Um, the Whalers is what our football team calls themselves. And the Vineyards high school football team, I hope they've changed their names because they call themselves the Grapes, you know, from the Vineyard. So the, the Whalers are always saying, we're going to crush the Grapes. Uh -huh. um, and it's a huge rivalry. And um, the Vineyard is very different from Nantucket. It has so many different towns, so many different people, groups of people. And it's also 15 minutes away from the mainland. So it's, right. yeah, very easy to get to. Um, so no, I haven't. 
Uh, so uh, we have a few more questions. So, and, and uh, folks, I would encourage you to get in your questions. We uh, might be able to squeeze them in. Uh, so Anne wants to know, uh, do you write for a specific time every day? Um, so I'm not sure if she means, uh, do you have a, you know, do you have a schedule where you, you write between uh, certain hours or maybe do you have a certain word count you try to reach every day? Uh, walk us through a normal day uh, for Nancy Thayer uh, when she's writing a book. Um, I love that question because I do have a schedule. I've had it, what, for 40 years. I get up in the morning, I make coffee, I feed the cat, yes, and I go up to the attic, which is now a beautiful place to be because we had a half moon window put in it and it looks out over the harbor. Um, not directly, there's some houses in between us in the harbor, but I can see the ferries come and go. I can see two lighthouses, um, but I have my computer away from the window because otherwise I would, I would just sit there and dream. Um, and I write until about noon. And that isn't always working, working, working. Some of it is sitting there and, and thinking and trying to figure things out. Um, if I can get five pages a day done with 250 words on it, on them, on each of the five pages, then I'm happy. In the past, I'd say five or 10 years, I've added something that I recommend when I go to bed at night, for some reason, I might be brushing my teeth or even getting in bed. My mind will say, okay, tomorrow you have to be sure that Wyatt goes down to the boathouse. And, and I know if I don't write that down, I'll lose it, I'll forget it. So I have my phone, my wonderful iPhone, and I, I send an email to myself. And if anybody read it, they would think it was kind of crazy. Um, but I, I can start the next morning looking at my email and there, there are my starting thoughts. I do that, I think I've done that every morning for a long time, for 40 years, and I don't I don't often get dressed unless we have grandchildren here. Um, because if I go to get dressed, I'll think I should exercise. I should do some laundry. Um, I, I don't want anything else to interfere. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful way to live because it seems like my, my mind is set on that schedule. Well, it's certainly working for you. Uh -huh. uh, so you've touched on this a uh, little bit during your uh, remarks, but Joyce would like to know, do you use real people as an inspiration for your stories? I have to think about that. Um, well, I use my children. I, I use a lot of things uh, from them because um, I've always taken things from their from their lives because it's not something I would, I would dream up. There was a day when I was divorced and living in a small house in Williamstown with my two children and it was spring and it was raining. And I told Sammy, my little daughter, grab your umbrella, which she hadn't needed. Um, it was hung in the basement in a little area of the basement. I said, bring your umbrella, you'll need it, it's raining. So she came out and she opened the umbrella and a dead mouse fell out. Oh. And, <laughs> and that's both funny and terrible. And, and I remember, because this is truly what happened, I remember thinking, what kind of a mother am I to let a dead mouse fall out of her daughter's umbrella? And I remember standing there and yelling at our cats. We had 
a cat named Fluffy and a cat named Blackie, and we had a dog named Penny. And I remember saying, why don't you guys do anything? You're supposed to kill the mice. And I, I, so that scene is in a book called Nell. Um, many of the things that I write about are inspired by my, my children and also from talks with my friends, but nothing is ever anybody you could recognize. Mm -hmm. You would right. never say, yeah, oh, this is Robert Hayes. Uh-oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the future a bit. And so you've already talked about the book you're currently working on. Uh, Fran wants to know more about your immediate future. Uh, she asks, um, what will be your role in the Nantucket Book Festival that's happening this week? I will be missing it for the first time in many years and hope you will post about it on social media. Fran, I can't believe you won't be here. I hope you're well. Fran lives in California. She comes, she has the most glamorous, wonderful life. She goes to New York in the spring and sees all the plays on Broadway. And then she comes to Nantucket and goes to all the talks at the book festival. I'm going to give a talk um, at two o'clock this Saturday at the Athenaeum at our library. Um, we're going to a dinner cocktail party after that. Um, there, are, there are so many good, important writers coming. And this is the 10th anniversary of the Nantucket Book Festival. So it's going to be, it's going to be quite wonderful. And I'm sorry, I can't remember all the people who are coming. No, no, no worries, Nancy. Uh, so Nancy, we're gonna wrap it up here. We just have about three minutes to go. Um, uh, folks, uh, for those listening, uh, let Nancy know in the chat uh, how much you enjoyed tonight's talk. Uh, Francine says, thank you, Robert and Nancy for such a really wonderful book chat. Patricia says she loved the talk and the book. Um, Elle says, I love this talk. Lisa says, this was so fantastic. I enjoyed it so much. Nancy, oh. you are wonderful. Uh, Fran <laughs> says, thank you so much for your talk, Nancy. She misses seeing you. Uh, Sharon says, thank you. This was so personal. Uh, Melanie says, thank you for a wonderful night. Karen says, you were fabulous. <laughs> Kathy says, I have loved your book um, and look oh. forward to many more. Uh, Corinne says, what a wonderful evening. Amy says, it was a great evening. Joyce says, it's been terrific. Uh, Barbara uh -huh. says, you are so real and relatable, Nancy. Uh, Sharon uh -huh. says that she loves your laugh. Mary says, this has been a nice visit. Eileen says, very enjoyable. Joanne, my old pal Joanne says, great talk. Sandy says, thank you for all your wonderful books. Joyce says that she loves your books and thank you for doing this. Diane says, I'm gonna see if I can watch Spirit Lost. Lisa says, I can't wait to buy all of your books. Lisa, yeah. that's a lot of books. Uh, Linda, <laughs> Linda says, thank you, Nancy. So glad there are more books from Nancy for me to read. Uh, Fran says, Summer Love was my favorite book so far. So wow. uh, Nancy, a couple of questions did pop up as they always do at the end. Um, let me see here. Oh, really, they're just more positive comments. Martha says uh, she can't wait to read this book. And uh, Francine again says, uh, thank you for this wonderful book chat. All right, well, why don't we uh, begin to wrap it up, Nancy? We have uh, about 90 seconds. Any last words for the audience before we end the session, Nancy? Yes, I love you all. Whether you're reading my books or like Robert Hayes, who works for a library and a library. I think books, books and public libraries are the foundation of our democracy, actually. There are a lot of countries where you, you have to pay to check out a library book. So I used to be on the board of trustees of our library. I was on the Friends of the Library. I think everyone should support their library in any way they can because, oh my gosh, what would mothers do without the children's librarian? On a rainy day here, everyone goes to the children's library. So I want to thank Robert. I want to thank all my wonderful readers. I love being in touch with you. Yeah. 
Uh, Nancy, uh, what a wonderful way to end. Uh, yes, support your local library, support your friends group, support your trustees. Uh, so folks, look for an email from me tomorrow, link to this recording, link to a feedback survey, and some more uh, information on some upcoming author visits. Uh, there'll also be information on how you can buy a copy of um, Nancy's latest book. Uh, and uh, how you can benefit the library by doing so. So thank you all so much, Nancy. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Stay cool. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Have a good you. night, Nancy. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay.